Let's hit it, boys! Why spend eight dollars a month on a blue check mark when you can spend five dollars or even ten on brunch's patreon it's a good question uh, the the benefits that we offer are way far and above what elon elon rat face musk Ooh. is offering <laughs> fucking god his ass whoa uh let's just verify all of our patrons that's a great question. Say so great... you are a verified brunch patron mm -hmm. for you could pay let's say yeah, you have to spend the ten dollars to be verified, but nah, no, we'll give five. Yeah, we'll give five this we, year only. We're separating the lords and the peasants. Love it. Uh this is the that 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 whole blue check mark thing is the dumbest thing in the you're not gonna pay eight dollars a month, are you? No, but I I'll tell you I who am. probably Just will. Kidding. Uh like companies like that's where they're going to make their money from companies are going to pay the eight dollars for all of their writers mm -hmm. and they'll fucking write it off or whatever and so like they're going to make a ton of money from this but it's like the people that are not working for a company and don't particularly care enough about the blue check mark those are the people that are going to lose that and like those people aren't particularly being impersonated a lot of the time yeah but it's still like it's still sort of like a pun intended, I guess, like badge of honor to be like, you've created enough of a space for yourself on Twitter oh, yeah. that you've established yourself as someone of value and you got the check mark for it. And now Musk is taking it away because you're not, you're not willing to pay $8 a month. Uh, it's, it's, it's bad. It's no good. But what, it's, but at the end of the day, it's also like, who gives a fuck? Yeah. I mean, I've never, I'll, when I got verified a million years ago, I was, I wasn't like throwing a party. It was and cool. I was like, but I was, I was like consciously not throwing a party because I wanted to throw a party. I was yeah, like, yo, like, I'm fucking verified. I now. wanted to check Watch real out, bad. Losers. Yeah. I wanted to check real bad because it seems like a real, like, hey, you, you've kind of you made, made it. it. Yeah, yeah, right. And so it was really cool when I got it, but like having it, people always respond to you, be like, oh, blue check marks, blah, blah, blah. Like they should take your blue check mark away. And literally my response to that has always been like, cool, you can fucking have it. Like I've realized now having it, doesn't fucking mean anything. I don't even use the verified tab that they give you uh, being a verified user. So, like, when you have the no, blue check mark, yeah. you have, like, um, whatever, the activity mention, the activity pay section of your notifications. They have the mentions tab of your notifications, and then they have the verified tab of your notifications, which is basically, like, if you want to see what other verified users are interacting with your profile – that's that's an option. And I never even fucking checked that because it's like, who gives a fuck? The only thing I have is you have to follow me for me to see it. That's all. Oh, like your uh, your notifications? Yeah. Well, that's like what that's what my tailored notification, like push notifications are. It's either like somebody who is verified or somebody who follows me. Uh, I think maybe. Or who I follow. I'm pretty sure if a verified person mentions me and I don't follow them, I'm not fucking seeing it. That's pretty good for you. Follow me, asshole. <laughs> I do. I do respect that. No, that, that, that and that's not like a ego thing. It's just more, more than likely. It's the not going to be an important. The more you miss, the better it is. Yes, yeah, so, and it's not going to be an important interaction. I mean, even if you, I haven't done this in a while, but even if you, like, you take a week off Twitter, you don't miss anything. Like the, you miss a lot, but none of it's worth missing. Like ex not, or exactly, nothing, it's not worth like keeping tabs on and. They don't miss you, which right. actually feels very good. Yes, because once, like, once you once you become okay with that, it feels very good. Yeah, that's. There I mean, were times when I was like, I'm gonna take a break, and then I take like a little break, and I'd be like, uh, nobody noticed that I was gone. That feels makes me feel shitty. But then it's like, I don't notice when anybody else fucking takes a break. There's yeah. so much shit going on, and everybody cares is wrapped up in their own little world. Like they don't give a fuck if you take a break or you don't tweet as much. Like I used to fucking... get that with work all the time. I'd be so afraid to take time off or to go away for a week because well they're gonna find somebody People to fill notice. in me for the week and then they're gonna be like oh well it makes no difference whether it's dj or somebody else and then dj's not there anymore and then like i don't know grew up a little bit and really like just do do what you need to nobody do. you're not as important to exactly. anybody as you are to yourself exactly and i see that with like 
a lot of people, especially like the way that I that people tweet, where I think Twitter can kind of give us uh, a heightened main character syndrome. Yeah, and some Twitter people, definitely makes you feel like you're important in all the wrong ways. Right. Uh, so yeah, Twitter rocks. Uh, <laughs> but glad, glad Elon Musk made that investment. Best tweet I've seen about this uh, is, and it takes a lot for this to be better than some of the fallout we've seen on Twitter since Elon, Elon Musk got Twitter, was uh, Chris Fleming, a comedian I've I've quite grown to like and who we should have on the podcast because he seems very brunch adjacent in that he like has his work that he does. He's a comedian, but I don't, he can't really make it through one sentence without making some reference to like an unhinged pop culture take that he has like i sent you the video of him uh yelling at an audience he's like florence pew just wanted to date zach braff you wouldn't let her and have you that you wouldn't let her she had to like you aren't satisfied until she dates all the members of muna <laughs> it's just like what a hilarious take and uh observation but he tweeted elon musk's elon musk's twitter journey <laughs> Is very Jack Skellington trying to do Christmas? I don't. I, I don't totally understand that because I think that I, my uh, what is it? Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. It, my I watched it like once. And yeah. I fell asleep halfway through and I was very high. Okay, so it's a, it, there's Halloween Town, there's Christmas Town, there's all the there's Easter towns, and he gets trapped in like Christmas, the Christmas Town, right? He is the face essentially of halloween right. town he is the hot shit in halloween yeah. town and he stumbles into christmas town and it is transfixed by all the lights the brightness like everything is in dreary so he comes back and he's like y'all there's a thing called christmas and we got to do it it fucking rocks so he tries to do it but he's doing it through a very Ha like I was raised on Halloween lens. So, like so everybody's dead. <laughs> most of the presents are like dead things. <laughs> and it goes very wrong, but I mean, may contain spoilers. At the end of the day, it's just like, hey, everyone's got a heart and everyone wants to have joy and wants to bring each other joy. So but I mean, he fucks the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. He gets Santa almost killed. They kidnap the Sandy Claus so Jack can be Santa Claus. And he thinks that it's all a very good, positive thing. And Santa Claus is like, yo, you brought me to Oogie Boogie? He's going to fucking kill me, man. They sing a whole song about it. It's great. Uh, but Tim Heidecker really has uh, done some of his greatest work here. This is like probably heavily problematic, but in an effort to show that Elon Musk's big, like, I'm bringing free speech back to Twitter thing is not the most easily executed thing tim heidecker yesterday just began tweeting that donald trump was dead <laughs> and then a bunch of people started responding saying yes i have heard the same thing and there's a newsweek story about it the first tweet was uh there's a video of uh uh trump so the video is as paul pelosi reportedly remains in icu donald trump spreads baseless conspiracy theories that the attacker has already disputed uh so Tim Heidecker quote tweeted that with Trump. I'm sad to say sounds like he's dying here. I think in fact, maybe he is and could possibly have a very grave disease of which he is dying. We don't know, but it's not good. <laughs> so and people of course respond. Somebody said, I just heard from a friend that he died. <laughs> sad face. Uh, Heidecker quote tweeted that with look folks. There are one of two things that could be happening. Trump is dead and they are covering it up or he is badly dying. <laughs> the moment badly dying <laughs> which do you believe then somebody responded with a fake like infographic that said it's official trump has died <laughs> horrible heidecker responded many are using hashtag trump is dead to spread the word many are sad by the news <laughs> awful uh somebody said fake news he actually didn't die as badly as people are thinking <laughs> heidecker said some have said this, but what we've heard was it was very bad and died in a sick way, exclamation point. Then later, here's what we know. One, Trump is dead, in parentheses, died badly. Two, Elon Musk has suppressed this news, or has he, question mark. 
three, Donald Trump Jr. is now just plain Donald Trump. Please like and share. I do love the idea of Heidecker uh, establishing a fan base full of MAGA people based on his last special in which he (laughs) essentially... Just mocked the hell out of them yeah. and like possibly tricked a bunch of them into thinking that he was serious and then has parlayed that now into spreading disinformation about Donald Trump. Now, you got like verified people tweeting wild that hashtag Trump is dead almost seems unreal, but it definitely is real. Good thing Elon Musk eliminated the content moderation department or it would have been hard for me to share the very true news that Donald Trump has died with as many people as possible. <laughs> I mean, there's like a hundred more tweets I could read, but I think you all got the gist of it. It's a very dark and crazy thing to laugh at lying about a person being dead. But I mean, if if ever there were a way to show in black and white terms, you there needs to be some sort of moderation of is this true or is this not true? Right. And today, of course, now there was some sort of uh, warning or like click through to see this tweet stuff on all of Tim Heidecker's tweets. And people, by the way, were responding like, shame on you. You should get suspended for this. And he's like, please take me off of this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm sure he would love to be suspended and he's trying to prove a point. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I, I feel bad for just like all the people that like built Twitter for the past fucking like 20 years yeah. and now all of a sudden Elon Musk is like okay this is mine now and obviously he paid a fuck load of money for it but like he's like this is mine now and I get to do with it whatever I want and also like if you don't follow my demands within a week I'm going to fire you so he reportedly told people hey I'm a code guy so print out all of the code to Twitter and I'll That's take a look at bananas. it bananas and they were like all the code so they did. They printed out like this gargantuan stack of papers and gave it to Elon Musk. And he was like, oh, well, that's this that's is ridiculous. what I asked for. I'm not going to read all this. So he had them shred it. And apparently Twitter is like a self refreshing and self like fixing thing where I think a lot of things are like this. I know nothing about coding. So please uh, cover your ears as I sound really dumb. Any coding people. But uh it like kind of fixes itself on the fly and does all that sort of stuff. And uh, he either didn't get that or the practice of just printing out all the code was completely useless because in like five minutes, the code's going to be different or something like that. Lovely. Man, I mean, I started off as like, what's the big deal? Why is everyone being so mean to Elon Musk? He just seems like kind of a weirdo who like maybe needs a few more friends or something. And it seems like he's trying to have fun and he takes the piss sometimes. I'm starting to get it, man. Yeah, I'm starting to get it as well. It's it doesn't it seems like it honestly seems like handing a toddler a gun. Yeah. That's, that's a good way of putting k- it. kind of the way that it feels where it's like this is a very powerful thing whether you like it or not. It is extremely powerful and it is extremely popular. And now because somebody made a fuckload of money, mm. they now have that very powerful tool and they get to do with it whatever they want. I've said this a few times. I got off Facebook a long time ago, and it was because of a borderline... Stalking is a dramatic term, but, like, somebody... Some, like, troll, internet troll that didn't like me, he was, like, a Boston sports fan, I'm sure, was, like, finding Facebook pictures of me and Photoshopping them and just doing all this, like, weird stuff. And it, it, it was, like... Pictures that I hadn't put out there, so I felt right. really fucking uncomfortable with that, so I just fucking closed That's, down. That was almost my exact same experience with Facebook and why I decided to get off Facebook uh, was, like, after the, uh, ironically, the Trump thing. Yeah. Where, like, when there was a uh, when there was like a lot of backlash, all of those, like, crazy people got most of their ammo from Facebook. Yeah. And... That I was like, ah, no. There, there's like too much. I don't know if paper trail is the right word, but Facebook leaves a huge paper trail. Oh, it's yeah, and it's so easy. Plus, I had Facebook way longer than Twitter, like in high school and shit. So, like, I I don't want to even know or think about like the stuff that I commented or like yeah. that kind of stuff. Like, and that, there's like I, pictures of you where you right. probably look exactly like you look now. Exactly. It's a <laughs> high school joke. I know. Yeah. I got it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, but when I got off Facebook, 
I legitimately don't even think once that I like instinctively or out of habit typed in Facebook.com a few days later or something. No. Like I, I just never thought about Facebook I, again. I never think about it now. I, like, whether The only time that I ever think about it is like, hey, my friend's like, I have this like event. Did you get the invite? I sent it to you on Facebook. Oh. And I'm like. I love when that happens. And I'm like, no, I'm not on Facebook. Yeah. I Every now and then I, or I used to. This is long ago. I would still get emails that was like someone invited you to something on Facebook, and I was I don't like, get "Those anymore?" I'm not on Facebook. I know. I feel like my my account maybe like is like in zombie mode or whatever, but like I don't know. It self uh, refreshes its code, so it's right. still writing the Facebook o- posts. I should you. I should uh, cl- uh one of the things that that uh well I guess it, it, the only thing that I missed after I deleted my Facebook was birthdays. It telling you whose birthday it was every day, and then I could say, "Hey, happy birthday!" But now, yeah. like, Instagram serves that purpose because, like, if it, if my friend it's their birthday, there's a good chance they're like sharing stories. Someone's or, going to someone will have done a story on them. They'll share it. I've got some birthdays in my phone. Um, friend of the podcast, Jen McCaffrey, is a birthday savant, and I would love to learn her ways of. She knows every. She just knows everybody's birthday, and it's not too. Maybe she keeps maybe she just adds it to her phone or something but you'd think it wouldn't be too hard a thing i if it's somebody's birthday now and i a couple years ago maybe this past year missed your birthday yeah like the, now i was just gonna say too like now i think we're old enough that it like doesn't fucking matter if you miss yeah. somebody's birthday or but like I feel, you miss my birthday but i i mean you still feel bad so now whenever it's somebody's birthday and I, I was very excited to be like you to, missed my I, birthday yeah I, I like turned it into like a I, I made you feel like an asshole and you felt really bad about it. But like, I honestly, the best birthday present that you gave me was not saying happy birthday to me because I got to be like, hey, fucking asshole. Guess what? And, and I'm remembering now. It was great. I, I was, uh, I was, uh, my, my, my personal life was enduring. Oh, come some on. Sort don't, of thing. Don't, don't, and I remember, no, no, because I remember I texted don't take you this an away update from me. On, no, no, I'm not giving you an excuse. I'm actually telling, like, I remember I was, I texted you some like minor life update, like on your birthday, like about like my, I was like telling you about my life on your birthday. And you were participating in that and everything. And then the next day you were like, hey, just a heads up. <laughs> Yesterday was my birthday. Oh, that's right. I did wait till the next day. And then the next day I texted you and I was like, hey, just so you know, I'm not mad. Yeah. I'm really not mad. Like we were talking on your yeah. birthday. Yeah. I was like, I'm not mad. I want to make that very clear. But you missed my birthday yesterday. And that was like, I don't know. Maybe I'm an asshole, but that, that was so great to be able to like drop that on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of big days, we had very different Halloween weekends. Uh, very different. You went to Arizona mm-hmm. to the Coyotes' first home game at Mullet Arena. And man, I so would have loved to have done that. It but was, it, it was the only, the, the only thing that would make me not go to something was happening this weekend, which was two ween shows in boston so you did fucking that looked so fucking cool man it was a lot of fun uh the experience was so i get really bad um travel anxiety uh particularly when i'm traveling alone or if i have not been traveling in a long time um like my anxiety really kicks into fucking overdrive and it was it was horrible this time around for whatever reason um like it like a week ahead of the trip i was fucking dreading it i just was like i don't want to go anymore um please fuck don't don't make me go um and then so my flight was like 9 a.m on on uh, oh, yeah. on thursday on thursday and i was supposed to go i was supposed to meet um frank my, the guy that i do tv with i was supposed to meet frank in arizona and he had an earlier flight than i did and he texted me at like 4 a.m on thursday saying that he he had COVID and he tested positive for COVID before he left her to the airport. So he was no longer able to go on the trip. I woke up like, I don't know if the the text woke me up, but like I woke up like 15 minutes after he sent me that text on, uh, on Thursday at like four 30 AM. And so of course I got that was not able to sleep after waking that after waking up to that. And I spent like the next probably five hours trying to figure out if I still had to go on the trip. Because all of our content plans were surrounding the two of us. Of course. We didn't plan anything solo for me. Um, 
But my boss lives in California, so he was on West Coast time. And so this was like like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. as I was like waiting for him to respond, trying to get a hold of him to find out if I was still going. I ended up having to change my flight to like noon to buy myself a couple extra hours to figure out if I was still going. And let me tell you, it didn't fucking help my anxiety oh, yeah. <laughs> going through that process. Uh, and I was like kind of holding on to hope that uh, I could just scrap the whole thing, not go um, and just stay home and be comfortable. But my boss ended up telling me to still go. And God, I'm so happy that he told me to still go because it was so much fun. And the shit that we got out of that trip in terms of content was some of the best that I've gotten in my time at Bali. It was just like a party. I got to be goofy and stupid with a bunch of people in the arena. A lot met a lot of great characters. And I had a, a ton of fun. And I think like the content that came out of it was very fun as well. So uh, it was also the first first thing that I've done that ended up being picked up by one of the Bally like networks and aired on the broadcast. RSN. So uh, very happy that it all worked out. But fuck, man, the anxiety. I think I'm going to have to go on medication uh, for when I travel from now on. I already talked to my therapist. My therapist was like, yeah, you should get you should go on like Klonopin. Yeah. So uh, I w- we were texting during the. uh the 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, fuck what happens uh, tomorrow time. And I was like, do you have Klonopin with you? I, I don't recommend, and everybody's different. I don't recommend uh, Klonopin to anybody unless they have to use it as a uh, former user and a prescribed user and a big fan of uh, of clonopin i i just clonopin stan over here i i i was until i learned a little more about it and i yeah. told one of my friends i was like my hey, therapist was like yo you you don't take it yes yeah, right right other unless other traveling. you fucking have to and like seriously if you do take it i'm talking to you not listeners or anything like Take it for the flight, and as soon as you reach the right altitude, crack a window in the plane and throw the bottle out Famously the window. Famously, crack crackable windows in, in that, plane in that yes. aircraft for sure. Yes, because otherwise you might use too much clonopin and die. Well, well, first of all, do not crack planes and the windows in <laughs> yes. planes, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, like that's that was my situation with uh, when I got my wisdom teeth out too, when they gave me the uh, like the whatever. Vicodin value. Yeah, yeah, whatever it was. I I didn't take it, and I just threw it out. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I get. Yeah, if I, if I get... It, that shit scares me, for sure. If I get prescribed uh opiates. I have an addictive personality, and yeah. so I'm very aware of that now. And, um, yeah, like, that's the only thing that scares me. But also, like, you know what also scares me? Being fucking... Cr- having crippling anxiety that prevents me from... D- Shut up! Oh, my God. Having crippling anxiety that prevents me from, from doing cool shit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- there's... A lot of drugs, I mean, have like intended effects. Yeah, right. And also, like, this is not a new thing either. Like, I, I think my awareness of my anxiety and my depression has certainly grown over the past several years. But like, I remember even when, in the early days of this podcast, like, that was the whole um, "what goes up must come down" thing. It was me having crippling anxiety about flying yeah. and planes and like sort of that's how i dealt with it like joking about chandler bing style yeah y'all. right yeah and so it's been a thing for me like when i talk to my therapist and when i talk to some other people about like my anxiety of flying my therapist was like that's wild because like i I've, the thought has never crossed my mind that like this plane might go down whenever i get on a plane and i'm like really that's like all i can fucking think about and it's like i don't know if that's like an obsession that is unrealistic or if it's like my my body like telling me a sign that like hey you ever like just get the feeling that oh like, yeah you're meant to die in a certain way or oh, something oh, or i mean you you get the feeling that like something is supposed to happen because your brain has your just kind of locked onto on it, it. Yeah, yeah right so like i have that with i have that with two things i have that with dying in a plane crash and committing suicide. Oh and like, God. I've learned that both of those things recently, like very recently, I've learned that both of those things are fucking like not normal and not healthy. You, uh, one time we, we had tied one on. I'm not telling tales out of school here. I hope, uh, no. you and I had tied one on and we were just like talking about life and everything. And you brought up that latter point and 
I kind of like snapped out of being drunk and was like, okay, time out. We're not <laughs> drunk. Uh, we can always relate to everything and everything. And I've certainly been suicidal before and everything, but like the, the, just like your viewpoint of it and like the way you were kind of coming at it, I was like, that's not like a happens to everybody thing. That's something that like is worth checking in on. Yeah. So I've since learned that there's a term for it and it is called suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have realized that that is like, or I've been, it has been communicated to me that that is a symptom of depression and like anxiety. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So like I never considered myself suicidal, but I was like fixated and fascinated by suicide and i like had this feeling that like i you that's know, how it i ends. thought about it a lot and like maybe that's how it ends for me at, at some point down the line that that like is a significant possibility for me and my therapist was like yo that is that is suicidal ideation and you are suicidal so it was nice to realize that, but like I, I get we're kind of like going off, not off the rails, but like off track. But the anxiety and depression awareness has really grown exponentially for me over the over the past few years. Mm. I uh, I mean I always thought well, like when I was younger, or whatever. Um, I imagined that maybe at some point, like there would I would reach like the end of my rope. However, that whatever that meant and as i've grown older like well we all reach the end of our rope in one way or another yeah uh but you i don't know just like through life and experiences of like even things that you'd think like uh if you embarrass yourself or like you feel really bad about something or whatever, like not to say like it doesn't matter and life goes on but i don't know like the, the more life you deal with the more hopefully you find that uh you can kind of decide how much rope there is mm -hmm. so just like appreciate that you can always go to the store and get a little more rope i don't like that we're saying rope so much <laughs> during a suicide conversation all right uh so you didn't did you do anything for halloween then i did not i i like really didn't miss it either uh i i like halloween a lot and i do enjoy uh participating and partaking and i'm not like a hey i'm too fucking cool for halloween i'm an adult so i don't think that, that exists i'm still very into halloween but i was very cool just sitting it out this year um just a lot of other shit going on and it was not super important to me and i'm glad that i got the opportunity to kind of like do something worthwhile that took me away from it rather than just sitting it out and being like passive i kind of did i do anything for halloween did we do anything for halloween last year no, definitely not because what, what, I was I was in dire straits around this time last oh, year. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh yeah, Halloween. Yeah, we were probably just like hanging out with each other. Like, yeah. Like watching TV or <laughs> mm. um I think this was around the time that you were getting in succession. Yeah, that probably that, yeah. That's probably just binge succession. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? It was it was it was a Saturday when I like I bet like we watched a Texas football game and that was and probably had a lovely evening, and that was it. I, yeah, I don't remember being anything for Halloween last year. This year, my friend, I did Halloween three times. That's bananas. Three ways, and like you, three cheese pizza. You made a fucking costume. Like you didn't, you didn't mail it in. You made a fucking costume. Oh, uh, which day for actual Halloween? Oh yeah, actual Halloween. That was like a last minute thing. That's what I'm too. saying. Like so, you fashioned. You MacGyvered a costume. So Friday night was Halloween, H-A-L-L-O, capital W-E-E-N. It was a ween Halloween show at Roadrunner, which there's two things I love in this world. Ween and Roadrunner. Ween and Roadrunner. Oh, my God. Got there. Like, huge lines. The, the, I've never seen a line at Roadrunner because they do everything right, and it's just so easy. Like, I've never seen a line to get in. I kind of line we talking about? Uh of people to get into okay, gotcha. the I, I'm sure people are doing lines at ween. I don't know if you're getting much cocaine at ween. Well, the one time that I've like really been out in public in which you ween got mattered? into a, yes. yes, we were at a, a party in Atlanta yeah. and you were like fucking really bonding with, with people over ween. And I took, I excused myself to go to the bathroom. And when I went to the bathroom, just drugs everywhere. Oh yeah, that was the night we were in Atlanta. Our flight got uh, pushed yeah. back, so uh, that we, was the best flight of my life, by the way, because oh yeah, we both 
dead, extremely blacked out, and, dead, uh, passed out the entire flight and came to in Boston. Yeah, we went to uh, we were at a bar in uh, Atlanta. I think we told this story like, on the podcast. Yeah, but very you... hipster guy saw my Ween shirt and was like, "Hey, want to come to this party?" And we're like, "Sure." We went. We definitely didn't do any drugs or anything, but no. we just knew it. as soon as we walked in, we were like, "Oh, this is like a party." It, it was. It was like essentially. After it was essentially like a, a like an underground party. Yeah, weird stuff. Anyway, it was very cool though. Uh, so yeah, you're right. There was. I'm sure people were doing cocaine there, uh, and we were just like. To be fair, though, like people do cocaine everywhere. Like I, it's one of those things that I've realized into adulthood that like people do drugs oh, a lot <laughs> so i that's something i eventually learned about pot where i was like oh like people's parents smoke pot yeah uh and now as i grow up i'm like oh like a lot of adults just like recreationally do cocaine that blows my mind i could i yeah. famously have never same even thought about it i same. could not have a worse i think biological composition being a sports fan from boston like i just i think that len bias prevented me from ever considering cocaine like hearing that story growing up, yeah, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm never doing cocaine, and I've like fucking stuck to that. I've never thought about it or been like, I should try this. I've thought about other drugs, cocaine, yeah, but like cocaine has just never been interesting to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think that um, two of the things that like into adulthood that I've kind of like grown awareness of, or like definitely realized my misconceptions how much money people make or like how much money like a rich person is. Cause like for forever, I was a dumbass who thought like, if you made like a hundred thousand dollars, you were fucking rich. Like, oh yeah. And once like, upon if time, I ever make a hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to be so rich and set for life. And that's not fucking true. Uh, especially now a hundred thousand dollars is like basically like, yeah. I mean, depending on, I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to like poo poo on it. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Because a lot of people, unfortunately, make, make less, uh, yes. a, a lot less than that. Like you, d depending on where you live, you can do certain things with certain amounts of money, but you're right. Like that was always the benchmark of like, if I make if six I, figures, I've made it. Then I can just work for one year, yeah. retire and just, and I all also the houses thought, I bought can make me money. And I also thought like making six figures was like, you are social elite. And I, I think that, as I've gotten older, you realize that there's a lot of money going around. And just because uh, maybe somebody is not particularly great, they could be overpaid. <laughs> and oh, yeah. A lot of people are making six figures that you uh, probably wouldn't expect. And a lot of people who you would expect are making six figures maybe aren't. So, like, that misconception and also, like, the misconception that, like, hey, drugs are a very big deal. And, like, I know who's on drugs. Yeah, so you don't. Patreon.com do slash listen to brunch. For, Help us pay for uh, drugs, money, and uh, potentially uh, drugs. Uh, but yeah, Ween's not really a cocaine crowd. Ween is. Uh, Ween's kind of more my speed. It's like beer and pot, and then there are definitely people doing like I'm sure uh, Molly or acid or mushrooms or whatever. The crowd is so, the people at ween shows are so fucking nice. Uh, but you also do have to consider that most of them, I would say are on drugs in some way, shape or form. So like I was talking to these, there was a balloon being, but being an outsider. Like, I don't even feel like that's why people are nice. I feel like ween is so fucking like niche and weird that like you we found each other. You appreciate it's unifying that you found somebody that appreciates it appreciates something so fucking weird yeah so uh friday uh dave lefkin friend of the podcast came down and we went to the show it was awesome set list was incredible costumes were on point dave and i uh were there's a lyric in the song mr richard smoker bruce and jeff will pick you up at 10 it's uh just about a gay dude hanging out with the boys and uh we don't know what Bruce and Jeff means, but Dave was Bruce Springsteen. I was Jeff Goldblum. That was a lot of fun. On Saturday, I uh, went with friend of the podcast and Vineyard Nights collaborator, Brad, and I was a chicken wearing a poison t-shirt because there's a song, the lyric in the song, Buenas Tardes, Amigo, where he talks about selling a guy a poison chicken. So everybody had ridiculous costumes. The band 
was fucking great. I love. I know you're seeing. Uh, we're seeing the 1975 this weekend. You're going two nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1975 probably a bit too young and commercially successful at this point to do the thing of doing two different shows. They'll probably do the same show twice, more or less. Mm-hmm. But there is something fucking amazing about back-to-back days, seeing a band you love, knowing and loving pretty much all their songs. They got some weird fucking songs. Uh, and just getting a totally different thing each night and being so excited every time they start a song because you didn't know they would play this one. It was so fucking great. I did accidentally, not accidentally. Um, Wait, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, how much, how much um, like rollover, how much... Uh, how many people did you see that were there the the previous night? I mean, I'm sure you weren't like looking out for that, but did you see several people that Good were there? Good question. I don't nights? know if I saw if I said, "Oh, hey, it's you from night one." I did talk to people when I talked to people at uh, on night two. We discussed whether they were there in night one, and a lot of people went both nights. But there were like there were these awesome guys that I had met. The last time Ween was in town, and I met, I saw them on night one, and they were super cool. They came over, said hi again, and I think they were like, "We just can't swing getting tickets yeah. for both nights." So, but like, but like, I think it goes back to what you're saying about the 1975. Like, the, the, like because Ween is more niche and uh, um, like less commercially su- successful. Like, I bet they know a lot of people are going to go both nights. And yeah. so they'll make the experience different for both those nights. Like when I when I saw um, Diary of Planet when they did their residency at the Great Scott, I think it was three or four shows, and all of them were really different. And I assume that it's because Diary of Planet had like a pretty rabid but cult like small fan base. Yeah, where it was like they know that they're gonna see the same faces over and over. Oh yeah, again. you got to mix it up, right? So uh, I think that's really cool. Um, like. I'm fully expecting to see the same show for the 1975 back to back nights, and I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, because I I, and I also want to experience it from like the floor and maybe up up top or whatever. So I like make the experience different for myself. But I think it's cool when like you get to see basically two different two different concerts. I wish back. that I wish that you could have gone on Saturday. Uh, just I I just really want to take you to see ween because you liked the dead and co experience so and i think you like i mean ridiculous weird stuff i liked you and uh brad or uh, you and dave playing ween yeah at idle hands like that was fun i did see one of the guys from that night at the show he came over and was like hey uh i was uh one of the guys in the front at idle hands oh and i was like fucking awesome oh uh after that show at idle hands you got offered a record deal oh yeah i did you i I assume that you did not take him up on that uh i didn't i didn't i don't know if i long story short yeah i i i I don't know that i have contact with that person but uh so brad was there night two and during one of the songs he turned to me and said, and again, this is like a, you got to remember people are on drugs thing. Uh, Brad turned to me and he was like, dude, I totally get why. Like, I can totally see you playing these songs. Like, I, like this is very up your alley. I definitely get why you would, like, play this at bars and stuff. You should do it more often. And, like, that was all he said. And at the end of the song... Someone in front of us turned around and was like, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you guys are like really like freaking me out with all the talking. And it was like the oh, I felt so fucking bad because I don't know. G- generally, if someone turns around and is like, hey, you shut the fuck up. I'm like, I probably had it coming in some way, shape or form. But this was a I was uh, night one. I was. I played it a little too fast and loose with uh, my level of inebriation. Enthusiasm? <laughs> no, like I was, oh. like, I doubled up on the gummies, oh, uh, had yeah, a lot of light beer, that. and was just on another fucking planet, which made it fucking great. I was in heaven. But night two... Wait, but like when you, were you talking a lot on night one? Because like when I double my dose of gummies, let me tell you what I'm not doing. 
Oh, it's I'm one. I'm not a, speaking in a public forum at all. I, I, will I mean, not speak for hours. Dave would have to answer that question. It's either I didn't say a word, or I I I couldn't. I can't see myself talking too much during Ween. No, or during and, concerts. Yeah, at all. Right. And I like I, I I I am curious to know how that what how that went on Saturday night because like I've been that guy before where I wanted to turn around and be like, yo, I came to watch the fucking concert, not yeah. not hear you talk behind me, and that that really pisses me off when like it's distracting when somebody's talking. It's like, why did you come here? And especially like so like they're. Uh, but if that's all he said, then oh no, then it, it's it, like, it, it was not a. I don't think it had reached a level of even like all right. If he if he keeps talking, I'll turn around and say something. It was like a very kind of first and last warning thing. Mm -hmm. But also, I just don't know. You don't know why somebody, why that's upsetting somebody, and maybe it is just like they want no talking at all, and they're fine for thinking that. So I was like, hey. uh, I was like, oh, my God, I've been where you are. I'm so sorry. Like, we'll zip it. But Brad was a little like, his like feelings were a little more hurt by it and was like, but you know, we, we're not, we weren't like being crazy or anything. And I'm like, yeah, but once you lock in, I, I'm sure like as soon as he started his sentence, she was like, this guy's talking too much. Yeah. And then like by the end of it, it's like, it's all she could think about or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I'm kind of playfully gaslighting her. And I, I don't mean to do that, but I was like, no, I get what you're saying. I was like, though. yeah, you, you never want to be the reason why someone's having a bad time. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the people there were super nice. I also, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was going to get a beer at one point and these two guys were like, this was on night one where I was, uh, I don't know, too much fun. And I was going to get a beer, and uh, these two guys were like, oh, shit, it's DJ Bean. I turned to them. I was like, oh, DJ, DJ Bean. And, like, screamed at them, <laughs> and then bought them two beers and walked away. They probably spent the entire, speaking of ruining the experience, they probably spent the entire rest of the night trying to figure out what the fuck happened and, yeah, and what your deal is. When I was waiting outside for my Uber, they came up to me, and they were like, hey, it's us. And I was like, hi. And they were like the guys that you got beers for. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad to see you. And they were just very cool about it because they got beers out of the deal. But they were like, dude, seriously, we were like teetering on the edge of like, would one more beer for us be too much? We, uh, I don't know. Let's wait a few minutes. And then you walked by, we said hello to you and you yelled at us and gave us <laughs> beers. And that like sent our night exactly where it needed to go. Oh, hell yeah. Well, yeah, that's no, great. Like, they knew, like, I, I don't think I can actually come off as sincerely bullying. Yeah. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, yeah, but like when when you're drunk, you like the 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 boundaries or oh, like yeah. your intended uh, yeah. The, your intended I think I'm actions. doing this yeah. is not always what you're doing. <laughs> right. Uh, I do fucking love the idea of like being an asshole, but then like counterbalancing it with a very nice gesture and like leaving people in a very in a very Confused wild state, state of confusion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm I I've, I've unfortunately kind of been going down that road a little. You remember at the Follow John Misty concert, a guy was like, dude. So good to, and I gave him like a make you flinch sort of thing. To who? Uh, the guy uh, after the concert, and then he hung out with us. He was so nice. <laughs> I don't remember. It made, like it made him laugh. <laughs> that seems like one of those. I like uh, interrupted him as he was like saying, one of those like, situations <laughs> where <laughs> your intended actions may be interpreted differently. I didn't do like a full blown like lunge at him. I just did like a like a small little like, just like hey, you want to marry your mother in law. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that sort of flinching thing. But uh, yeah, both nights of Ween were uh, were so so much fun. And then yeah, the, then actual Halloween last minute, I got some felt and threw together a Johnny from Sing costume for my nephews because they love Sing. They didn't totally get it, um, but still went trick or treating Fucking with idiots. them. Oh, dude, it, it was such a it was a pretty accurate costume. Right, I mean, it was. I had like the. I'm not. I'm not deep oh, into yeah. the sing universe. I've seen you're not the first a sing one. head. I I've forgot. seen the first one, but uh, I know who you're talking about. It's uh, Taron Egerton's yeah, character. Yeah, I got to reuse the leather jacket from the uh, Jeff Goldblum costume. There you go. It was a great time. Yeah, trick or treating was uh, really fun with the old uh, kiddos. 
Uh, would you want to talk about um, the outfit real quick? Yes, we've talked about costumes. Now let's yeah. talk about the the real. We watched outfit. a very random movie. I don't know, like my exposure to whatever this movie is or was. I I know you're a big Mark Rylance guy. Yeah, famously. But I I also am. I don't really know him by name. But like once I saw him, I was like, oh yeah, this guy. I like this guy. You suggested this movie. Why? Okay, I th- I saw trailers for this in theaters, and I was like, holy shit, I love this movie. It's Mark Rylance, set in the 1950s in Chicago. He's a tailor, not a tailor. No, he's, he's a not. cutter. He's a cutter. Uh, which there's a difference I learned. And a he, tailor fixes suits, a cutter makes suits. Yes. And uh, anybody with a couple of thimbles mm-hmm. and some, That seems very disparaging. Yes, that, that, that was, was like, a... Yeah, he, he's really poo-pooing the the tailoring like, I, industry. It's okay, like okay, you're not a tailor; you're a very snooty cutter, <laughs> yes. is what you are. But uh, he has some criminal ties. He uh, basically has a drop box for uh, a gang to put their money and their messages and everything, and they it's, stop by his his uh, his cutting shop has basically been co-opted by the the mob as a. Not a headquarters, but like a, um, I don't know, like a little a, gas a, station, a little gas station, yeah, well, like a, a little communication stand, yeah. And uh, one night somebody comes in and there's trouble, and there you have a big long night in this tailor slash bespoke slash cutting shop, and I I just remember from that trailer I was like all in, mm-hmm. all in, so excited. I didn't remember it hitting theaters. And then the other day, my sister was like, hey, I watched this movie on Amazon Prime, uh, The Outfit. And I was like, cool, what's it about? She was like, oh, you probably like it. It's Mark Rylance. And I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> and she starts telling me about it. I was like, that fucking movie came out. What the hell? Yeah, I had no idea uh, that that like this. I didn't see a trailer for it, I don't think. I No exposure. It was like less exposure than uh, uh, Confess Fletch. Yes. <laughs> um, but this was my first exposure, I believe, outside of Curb Your Enthusiasm, to one Dylan O'Brien. Oh, really? Yeah, Dylan O'Brien is the uh, the I mean, son. I knew that. I, yeah. So I, as I was watching it, I was like, this is a good movie for brunch because I'm a Rylance guy. I'm he a Dylan likes O'Brien. Dylan O'Brien a, a lot. I'm a Dylan O'Brien, uh, like, as a person kind of guy. No exposure to his work. So you're, like, in the early days of the 1975's relationship with uh, brunch. Yes. Where yeah. I would... I didn't have songs to send you, but I would send you Maddie Healy interviews. Interview clips, yeah. Right. And like a year later, you were like, have you heard any of his songs? Because I've been checking them out. And they're good. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm the 1975 yeah. guy by, by some uh, twist. but Because you uh, listen to their music. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, no, uh, first Dylan O'Brien exposure. Got to say, uh, not impressed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Acting. Pretty bad actor, I guess. Uh, bad acting in this movie, except for uh, one person. Uh, Mark Rylance. Mark Rylance. Man, that's him, yeah. I love the, Mark Rylance, man. I don't know where... Hive the, stand up. I don't know. I, I guess, like, it's a weird it's a weird situation because, like, Mark Rylance is usually not a leading man. Um, certainly can be, as we found out in this movie. He was very great, and yeah. I thought that he was awesome in the role. Uh but I guess it's a warning sign when Mark Rylance is a is a is a, a leading man that the rest of the cast may not be very good because you know it's a good you're kind of in a you're kind of playing from behind. It's sort of like a minor league cast, I would say. Oh but, yeah, but everything else from a production standpoint seemed very good. This movie viewed or played more like a play. Like this would be yeah, th- that, this right. movie would be an awesome awesome play play yeah and who knows maybe well because it was. it's it's all in one location like I assume the budget for this movie was very small yeah it's all in like one location and I assume they didn't have to pay much for the actors yeah I don't I hate poo poo and acting a lot of I know times that's too, the thing like, it makes you seem really snooty and like but and like I'm certainly no fucking acting critic yeah but when when I can tell that the acting is not good. The acting is very bad. And when the the movie started, it, it opens with this great scene, and then you see more characters start to trickle in. And I was like, oh, no. I think there's only one woman in this movie. And I'm not poo-pooing. It, it's, it's Zoe Deutsch, who uh, I, I've i not seen as being the greatest actor. So I'm like, ah, oh, this is... She's kind of being given a tough task here. 
but she was fine in it. She I think was like, I think everybody in this movie was punching above their weight a little bit. Yeah, yeah, everybody, and like I, I, that's a great role for Zoe Deutsch to take, and it's a great role for Dylan O'Brien to take. Uh, in Dylan O'Brien overacted mm-hmm. for sure. Johnny Flynn overacted for sure. Really, it's like a. I would probably say Zoe Deutsch is like the gave the she second best performance fine, yeah. in this movie. Dylan uh, O'Brien like forced the accent a little bit too much. It seemed very. Um, it's a lot of like. It uh, seems like what well, the circling me, back I'm a guys gangster, do, <laughs> and I, I live that gangster life. It honestly you don't know seemed being like a gangster like me. It seemed like the circling back bit where they do like the, the 20s, 1950s yeah. voice or the 1920s voice. Yeah, uh, but I will say. I enjoyed the movie. I still like, like the movie. I, I liked the movie. I liked the story. I was invested the whole time. I think that it's a... It's I a do, mystery, by the way. It's You're a thriller. Trying to figure out, hey, who's... Who, who, who's the rat? Who's who's doing this? Yeah. Um, I liked the movie. Um, I, I do like when movies are able to kind of have like, um, like one place and yeah. tell a story from... It was the a bottle wh- episode. Yeah, that's right. The whole movie was a bottle episode, and you figure out the story based on who's coming in to the to the, the cutting shop. Yeah, and, uh, you, that's how you like introduce the characters, and like you have to kind of put things together. It was a, it was a fun experience. It does crank it up from. It seems like it's never going to reach a ten, which you're fine with. Mm-hmm. Like this movie, if if this movie were a paint job, it would be matte. A paint job? Yeah. Matt. Oh, Matt Paint. Yeah, like M A T T E. It's know. not Matt. Matt Paint. It's not can a get the it, job done quite a bit, quite quite well. Oh, I love Matt yeah. Paint. I think it's a great look, but it's it doesn't have a big sheen on it. True. It's not big and uh, it's not big and crazy. And you think like, all right, like it's kind of base level is going to be between like a four and a seven at all times, and that seven's going to feel good because it's just going to be the highest end of its scale. And then at the end of the movie, it kind of ramps up to like like a 13, 14, 15, and you're like, okay, I don't know if I necessarily needed no, all no. of these things. Yeah. But I, I, I paid attention the whole movie. I love Mark Rylance. I'll watch that guy do anything i'd say that this is a positive step for zoe deutsch it is definitely the best zoe deutsch dylan o'brien movie i've seen this year same for did, sure did you see not okay no oh i didn't realize that they were both in that as well would not recommend <laughs> that movie stinks baby um i will say i did not need uh, the I don't uh, know why i'm getting cooked <laughs> I did not need the final like ten minutes of that movie. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, man. I I'm know, like... I know exactly what you're talking about. I did not need the final ten minutes, and it's hilarious because um, I had a I had a meeting um, like about about an hour ago, and I stopped right before the final 10 minutes so i i like assumed that it just ended kind of there and i was like oh dj's only gonna dj's gonna be here in like 15 minutes okay i'll, I'll watch the final 10 minutes of this movie holy fuck it becomes a whole different movie yeah the movie really uh it really rolls up its sleeves yeah uh, towards the end and yeah it didn't need all of that but man Rylance Hive. Dude, it's it's kind of like when um when like somebody gets a little momentum telling a story and then they are they kind of get carried away with like how invested people are and like how many ears they really like they're like, "Ooh, I've got everybody's attention. Let me keep telling stories. I don't want to give up the attention." And then they start like kind of losing people. That's what this movie did, I think. Yeah. I'm trying to uh Okay, just want to make sure. When you said Mark Rylance ideally is not uh the leading man, He's like an Octavius Spencer level mm-hmm. supporting actor. And I just want to make sure that he won for Bridge of Spies. You ever seen Bridge of Spies? No. It's him and Tom Hanks, buddy. And you come away from that movie being like, Tom Hunks. <laughs> Tom who? Because Mark Rylance was great in that movie. Mm-hmm. Like, so he is, he's goaded, man. I want to bring up at some point, I want to... There's a lot of goats. I want to start implementing uh, super goats. It's okay. like a blue check mark goat, or it's like verified a, goat. It's like a verified goat sort of thing. And like Mark Rylance is a goat. I would yeah. say he's not like a. He's super not a verified goat. goat I don't yeah. know how many how many super he's, goats. He might you... be a goat in like the brunch world. Like Michael Stuhlbarg is a goat in the brunch world, yes. but not a goat in in the real world. I like we need we need to I come up like a run like a whiteboard yeah right like we need to like brain, brainstorm brunch goat uh, a name for that 
Um, Taylor Swift's a goat, I would say. Taylor Swift is probably a goat in the real world, but not in the brunch world. Yeah. By the way, folks. Reverse goat. I'm, I've become uh, everybody's ticket buying uh, advice giver, which all the advice may be bad, but keep calm with these Taylor Swift pre-sales and everything. Last, last time Taylor Swift toured, if you just waded through that first crazy thing, you get face value tickets in good areas like before the show, not even on resale. Like we the uh the Atlanta show that we went to, we got awesome field seats. Mm-hmm. We just got them face value from Ticketmaster like two months after they went on sale. So if you don't get exactly what you want on the first try, relax because and especially post pandemic. Concert ticket sales are a lot more finicky than they were before, where you could get them and then just sell them later. Like, if you spend a ton, you might end up eating those if you don't want them. So, keep cool. Uh, to celebrate this weekend's 1975 Fest, uh, the Friday episode on Patreon, we are going to do some 1975 content. So, subscribe to the Patreon, patreon.com slash listen to brunch, and we will see you Friday.